series, and this is, um, I believe, the last lecture for this semester. Um, so we will pick up again in September. Um, so I appreciate you coming, and we have a ter terrific um, topic today and speaker, um, cardiac uh, rehabilitation, a big topic in, in the Vermont Center of Behavior and Health, um, and an expert, Steve Kintayan, um, who uh, Phil Ades can introduce. And um, Phil, how about if you come up? Okay. Thank you, Steve, and I'm very happy to invite to introduce my friend and uh, past and future collaborator, uh, Steve Katayan, who's Director of Preventive Cardiology at Henry Ford Hospital and directs their cardiac rehab program. And he's also a professor at Wayne State University, which has a big behavioral uh, component. Um, he's recognized particularly for his research in heart failure and has some of the seminal studies of the value of exercise in heart failure. Uh, and he continues to be involved in studies that investigate how exercise testing and training helps in the diagnosis, treatment, and care of people with cardiovascular disease and cancer. Uh, he's active in several organizations, uh, including uh, our national AACVPR, Cardiac Rehab Organization, where he's on the board, the American College of Sports Medicine, and he serves as editor-in-chief of ACSM's Health and Fitness Journal. Uh, he's authored over 170 peer-reviewed articles, co-author of four textbooks, one of which is uh, very uh, highly used in cardiac rehabilitation. And I'm proud to say that we've collaborated on several studies and currently have a two-center grant in being evaluated soon uh, with Diane Galima as PI. So we're hoping to work together again on an upcoming NIH grant. So very happy to inter introduce Steve, and thanks for coming to visit us. Yeah. Well, thank you very, very much. Um, I've had the pleasure today to meet with several of your younger faculty and postdocs, or excuse me, postdocs and, and pre-docs. And uh, if I were to sum up in one word, I'm saying I'm just really, really impressed. Uh, it's nice to, I don't get out very much. It's nice to be in an academic setting and hear the enthusiasm in their interest areas. And, and as you'll see, I'll boil it down at the end. A lot of this is just human behavior. <laughs> it's working with people and changing their behaviors, which is what surrounds cardiac rehabilitation. So it's been very, it's been very enjoyable for me. And again, thanks so much for the, for the opportunity to come. Um, I just thought I would start with a patient story just to break the ice. It really has nothing to do with my topic whatsoever. But if you've given me an hour to talk, I don't want to take it all up on just well, my normal topic. So this is a, and, and one reason I would also say this is that we often need to take the time to learn the patient's backstories because they all have rich histories and come from different areas, and it helps shape how we work with the patients. But this is a, a story about Pablo's, uh, Pablo Davis, uh, born in 1916. He was one of uh, 13 children, grew up in Philadelphia, had a nanny. And um, we had one of his big marks that he left on the city of Detroit in his waning years is he actually developed pushed hard for intergenerational housing where you would have high at-risk youth along with seniors and there was kind of a mentor relationship and there's actually two intergenerational houses uh, in, in the city of Detroit. But uh, his, his personal story I found a little bit interesting that at the age of around 16 or so he left Philadelphia because he heard that Pablo Rivera was painting the famous, now famous, uh, you know, wall of industry or mural of industry at the Detroit Industry, excuse me, Detroit Institute of Art. And he literally had 12 or other, you know, 12 or so other people painting this wall with him. It took him several years to complete, but Pablo heard it was there um, and, and went and literally sat on the steps. And every day when Diego Rivera would go in, he would walk right past them and he'd ask to come in and help and he would ignore him. Finally, his wife, uh, Frida, said, and when's the last time you ate? And, you know, should we bring you in and have a sandwich? And where are you staying? And long story short, he ended up assisting um, with the painting of, of this wall in, in, um, in Detroit. Um, Pablo, uh, his political stance has changed over the years. And a little later in life, he was a devout communist. A little later in life, he went to Spain to fight on, the, on behalf of the revolutionaries. This is a, and this is more than an office visit story. You're walking with them in the rehab setting, OK? But he he's, um, went and fought with the revolutionaries in Spain when Franco, a fascist, was, was controlling the government at that time. And um, during, during the battle, his group was actually, he was injured. His group was pushed up against the France border, the Pyrenees Mountains. 
and France said, no immigrants, we're not going to let you, we're not going to let you in, um, we, we don't want to have to deal with this. But the story gets to be, start to become an interesting twist now because two very prominent uh, people of, the, of society in France at the time, uh, Madame Curie and, and, um, and Pablo Picasso, bent, both went to, the, to the Spain, Spain's, Spain's border and said, we want you to let these people in. And the government caved and the government said, you're welcome to come in. And Pablo Picasso heard that there was a painter uh, in this group or had heard about this. And he went up and met, uh, um, uh, met uh, Pablo Smith now that we call him, but Pablo, Pablo Davis. And, and he said, when the war is over, um, I'd like you to come back to south of France and I will give you a, a studio to, to paint in my, in my, in my uh, four floor, my four floor of, of, of villa. So Pablo Davis came back to the to, 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 uh, United States. He was in prison for a while because of his communist message. He eventually released. War was over. And he did go back to the south of France and hooked up with uh, Pablo, uh, Pablo Picasso. And he gave him a fourth floor studio in his, in his, um, his uh, you know, place of residence at the time. So he gave him a place to paint, and, and Pablo Davis is painting this really nice mural of the landscape in, in France, and Pablo Picasso walks in one day, and he's telling the story in his bathrobe. He said he lived in his bathrobe during the day. He walked in in his bathrobe, and he pr literally took the, 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 um, the mat off the easel, and he just threw it out the window, went downstairs, crushed it up, and threw it in the garbage. And next day, Pablo Davis said, why did you do this with my, with my painting? And he said, because there was no passion. Tell me a little bit about yourself. So he told him the story about growing up in Philadelphia, going to Detroit. He said, paint me that. So over the next month or so, Pablo Davis painted a, a scene from growing up, was one of 13 children growing up in Philadelphia with a nanny, and Pablo Picasso loved it. And uh, once a month, someone would come over from the Louvre and, and take the, the best of, or the ones that Pablo, Pablo Picasso wanted to have hung in the Louvre, or the best of the, his paintings. And Pablo Picasso, as you might guess, slipped in um, this painting from this, this visitor for, for a month. And the curator from the Louvre, oh, Pablo Picasso, this is your best work ever. And he said, you idiot, I didn't paint this. This person did. But, the, the, but his painting to this day from Pablo Davis uh, hangs, in, hangs in the Louvre. So again, just a good, rich story. We have these all amongst us as we see our patients. And I would encourage us as we work with them to maybe sometimes take a second and learn their, their backstory along the way. So I just want to cover three topics during my next uh, you know, 40 minutes or so, and I'm going to try not to rush through. Some have a good understanding of cardiac rehabilitation, many maybe do not. I want to talk about a little bit about the effectiveness of the service from a clinical perspective, some of the challenges we have right now in terms of the utilization and referral to the service, and then spend a little bit of time, and if time permits, on more, maybe more time, what are the strategies we're using to improve enrollment, improve out outcomes, improve utilization, and maybe an, even an alternate delivery model if I have time that, we're, that we use. Just to bring everybody up to speed, uh, in case you haven't seen it on day to day, cardiac rehabilitation is traditionally about 24 to 36 visits in length. Um, we, can, we, can, we can have it one time per week, two times per week, three times per week, but we, so we can spread it out even over 36 weeks if we want to do it once a week. Uh, and we, at our institution, we usually dovetail in about seven educational lectures along the way, each about an hour uh, in duration. And these are the types of patients that we would see in the program. So there's supervised exercise, usually followed by education. And really no surprise, these are the typical patients that we would see in a cardiac rehabilitation setting. Our heart failure patients are, are only limited to those with a reduced ejection fraction, the poor ability to contract versus the other one, which uh, type of patients with heart failure, a poor ability of their heart to relax. But in general, these are well covered by insurance and the types of patients we see today. Um, just a summary slide, I can't think of a drug that has as much systemic benefits as regular exercise training or cardiac rehabilitation. Whether it's at the cellular level, whether it's at the, uh, the uh, tissue level, whether it's at the organ level, uh, a, uh, you know, mood level, clinical outcomes, either really effective or, or, or effective or seems to be heading in that direction. We have pretty good evidence now across the board that, that cardiac rehabilitation is beneficial for patients with, uh, patients, beneficial for patients with cardiovascular disease. I'm going to go into a little bit of detail on several of these. Um, and to begin with, there are several meta-analyses right now on the uh, effectiveness of cardiac rehabilitation. This is one from Heron in 2011. But you can see in terms of cardiovascular mortality, all-cause mortality, or hospital re uh, readmissions over a six to 12-month period of time, 
somewhere between a 10 to 30 percent, 10 to 20 percent reduction in these hard endpoints that we will want to see that it has an effect. Pretty good evidence now, a couple meta-analysis, and one just came out a couple weeks ago. I don't have that slide, but in general, from a meta-analytic point of view, uh, seems to be the same. This is a more recent one from Anderson, 2016. Here's, um, here's cardiovascular mortality, there's hospitalization. You can see about a 25% reduction in cardiovascular mortality, favorable about an 18% reduction in, 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 in hospitalization. So again, clinically, on pretty safe ground, uh, risks for cardiac rehabilitation are, are low, benefits uh, are fairly, uh, clinical benefits are fairly, fairly high. Um, the, the first, the, those other two slides were for patients with coronary heart disease. This is for a patient with heart failure. Uh, this is the ACTION trial. We randomized 2,300 patients to hopefully at least a, at least a year of, of exercise versus a year of usual care, followed them for all-cause mortality and hospitalization, and then just general follow-up going forward. Here's, all, here's the primary endpoint of uh, all-cause mortality and, and all-cause hospitalization. And you can see at around one and a half years now, we're starting to get a separation between exercise and usual care. Overall risk reduction, about an 11% adjust, reduction in, in adjusted risk with exercise training in heart failure versus, uh, versus usual care. This really was the data that in 2014 swung CMS to reimbursing now for patients with, with re heart failure and reduced ejection fraction. This and some of the other studies that came out of that trial. So, so very gratifying for me to put a lifetime of work into studying heart failure to be part of a project that really helped shape public policy and now patients with heart failure are covered uh, as they go through cardiac, uh, cardiac rehabilitation. Seems to be a couple really good questions from the people, young people I met with today around dose effect. There seems to be only a couple observational studies so far. A dose effect associated with cardiac rehabilitation and that the more, in that, in that more is better. Um, if you compare 36 visits versus, 36 visits versus, you know, only one session, much, much lower reduction, about 47%. 36 visits versus 12 visits, 36 versus 24. Each way, uh, there still is benefit, but gets less. So a little bit of a little bit of a dose effect as we go. The more is better would be, would be a take-home message. But only two only two or three studies that have looked at this and really not well-controlled randomized trials. But there seems to be a signal along that way. Uh, data from our lab, very soft, not not um, not um, uh, spread out over many centers. Just a single center data. We just looked at while patients in cardiac rehabilitation. What speed were they walking at when they left the program? Walking on the treadmill, what was their treadmill exercise training speed? We converted that to METs, metabolic units, excuse me, metabolic equivalents of tasks. Right now, you're all, you're all expending one MET, sitting as one MET. We just, we just expressed their treadmill um, exertion as multiples of their resting energy expenditure. And people that were working at around three METs or so, which would be about two and a half, maybe 2.8 miles per hour, one in three year, um, one in three year mortality rates, and clearly you can see, especially in follow them over three years, those that were training at discharge from cardiac rehabilitation, and there's some shortcomings and limitations, but training at around three mets or above, really had a much lower uh, lower risk of mortality over three years than those that were training below that. So walking speed, walking gait, function is related, and improving that is related to uh, is related to outcomes. So, right, my background's physiology. One question that I'm going to ask is, it's great that we have an effect, but how does it work? I want to spend a little bit about the intermediate factors that might be involved for maybe some of the, less maybe for some of the behavioral people in the audience, but more so for some of the cardiac rehabilitation people in the audience. So how does it work? Um, this is just an elegant study done by Hambrook, who's done much great work, uh, New, England General, New England General now, almost 15 years ago, 16 years ago, and they literally just randomized about 10, excuse me, about 20 patients with known coronary heart disease to uh, about four weeks of exercise versus four weeks of no exercise and did intercoronary um, injections of acetylcholine to see if we could, how the coronary arteries would respond with training versus no training in terms of endothelial function because no, we know endothelial dysfunction is a marker of coronary heart disease. And you can clearly see, and this is looking at change in luminal diameter, but you can clearly see and I think I might have flow rate on the other side. Yeah, we've got uh, blood flow. You can clearly see expressed as either blood flow or coronary, uh, coronary luminal diameter. 
control group without exercise training, really no change in either of those measures of endothelial function, but with training actually could have an effect on both the coronary flow and, and coronary luminal diameter with an exercise training response. So it could really tie a mechanism to improve, improved, in this case, improved regional blood flow to, to the myocardium. And if we have endothelial dysfunction in the coronary arteries, we also have endothelial dysfunction in our peripheral arteries, in our uh, radial artery, brachial artery. What effect does exercise training have on um, its inability to dilate during exercise? We want our, our larger vessels to dilate so flow can get through to the working muscles uh, during, during exercise training. Really nice study by Wisloff. Took 27 patients uh, with heart failure in this case. Uh, no, no exercise control group. MCT is moderate continuous training. We take them up, keep them at that pace for 30 minutes or so, and then let them cool down. And then his third group was, was a higher intensity interval training. We gave them bouts of high and low, uh, higher, up to about 90% of peak or so, high and lower bouts of, of exercise training. And you can clearly see exercise training was better than control, and interval training was even better than and moderate continuous training. So you could partially reverse the, the endothelial dysfunction. It would be a mechanism that we could look at, partially reverse those problems in patients with uh, heart failure. Uh, same group, a different, different study, patients with heart failure. Now we've got a microelectrode micro, um, micro in the perineal nerve and, and looking at bursts of sympathetic activity down that nerve. We know patients with heart failure have overactive sympathetic nervous system, and we're using that nerve traffic as a measure of that. Uh, three, groups, um, three groups, two of them with heart failure, one a healthy control, and at rest, these big red circles is the bursts per, per, uh, bursts per minute of sympathetic nerve activity going down that nerve in the leg, and you can see both heart failure groups are much higher than control. But with training, the exercise train group versus the heart failure group that didn't train, we had a marked decrease in sympathetic activity. So if overactive sympathetic activity is a, is a marker of problems or it's an intermediate problem in these patients, we can downregulate it with exercise training. No difference in heart failure that didn't train. In fact, compared to controls, we almost normalized it with, an with a relatively short-term four-month exercise training bout. So again, a mechanism of benefit. I spent a lot of time inside the skeletal muscle. My earlier work was skeletal muscle biopsy, looking at the changes in, in histochemistry and, and, and structure of the skeletal muscle. And just a summary article here, you can see that with exercise training, we get increased size of the, of the skeletal muscle, increased strength. We also get improved, improved mitochondrial function in terms of its ability to move aerobic metabolism, which we'd want to have in these patients. You can see on the, on the right there, we're looking at mitochondrial and stain for same for, for an oxidative enzyme, cytochrome C oxidase. Look at the size of the mitochondria pre-training versus post-training. Much more dense, much more active, much larger, um, a beneficial effect so the oxygen that gets to the tissue, the cells can go ahead and use it. Um, there's really no shift in the types of fibers we have, maybe a little shift in the types of fibers we have, and, and it might be a shift or no shift in capillary density, but in general, some favorable, some favorable changes. And finally, actually from uh, Dr. Aidy's lab here at Vermont, uh, again back to patients with uh, coronary heart disease, but this is an obese population. He looked at the effect of, of really high caloric activity. Uh, most cardiac rehabilitation programs will expend, let's say, six, seven, eight, maybe 900 calories per week. It doesn't really budge weight loss in the typical cardiac rehabilitation center, but your program here said we're going to go much higher pushed patients up to about 3,000 or, 30, again, obese, overweight, obese patients to 3,500 calories of exercise expended to, per day, followed them over 12 months. Clearly, you can see I'm just showing the five-month viewpoint, and that's what we have down here. But waist, uh, HDL, cholesterol, blood pressure, triglycerides, glucose, all improved, uh, and in several of the cases, much more with, much more with the higher volume of, of exercise training versus the standard volume of cardiac rehabilitation. So we can impact things intermediately and they probably affect, at least translate, into the clinical benefits that we see in terms of clinical endpoints that we would measure in, in, in clinical trials. So it seems to have underpinnings, uh, it seems to have good efficacy that's based on good underpinnings of physiology. Uh, this is just last, it's a really simple one. This was really one of the first things that was investigated I mean, you could make this slide from the 1960s or 1950s or so, from the, from the 1800s if you want. You take a patient with known angina and you exercise them, and they say, I get angina every time I walk through the airport. 
come back the next day, I get angina every time I walk through the airport. It's the same, pretty much repeatable event. That's their threshold. I walk the dog and 10 minutes out, I get my chest pain. Happened yesterday, happened today, it's stable. Uh, and that's what we see here, the level of oxygen consumed when they get their angina pretty much is fixed. The level of oxygen consumed by their heart, every time they walk that dog, that's fixed. However, if we put them on an exercise training program, we can shift that curve to the right. Patient comes back in you know, six weeks and says, I'm having less angina. They're still going to have ischemia if they get that chest pain, if they get up to this level. But when they walk the dog now, that ischemia just doesn't happen because the heart and the system is much more efficient. It can handle what oxygen has better. It doesn't require much oxygen, so the patient, bottom line, feels less symptoms. And I would take that as a win. The patient says, I'm having less symptoms. Thank you very much. This exercise has cured me. No, we haven't cured you. You still have coronary disease, but we can tolerate it better by just shifting that curve to the right. Big benefit for the patient. So let's just talk a little bit about, um, let's just talk about where does cardiac rehabilitation stand in terms of utilization and referral. And I thought one good place to start would be where were we at, let's say, when I joined Henry Ford Hospital in 1980, where, in 1981, where were we at 16 years, excuse me, 36 years ago? What was kind of the environment? So I had been at the hospital now for about two months. I was um, at the main computer. I was doing a lot of stress testing at the time. I was at the main computer pulling off a uh, an ECG for somebody I was going to stress test next. And one of the cath lab docs, Jim Brimer, came in the room. He's since passed away. Came in the room, and we hadn't met before. So we did our introductions. I, I am Stephen Katayan, work in cardiac rehabilitation. These were the next words out of his mouth. You people in rehab are nothing more than a glorified Vic Tanny's gym. What we do in the cath lab saves lives. The resources that go to you should go be going to us. Welcome to Henry Ford Hospital. So that was the environment for cardiac rehabilitation 30 some years ago. If you don't bother me, you guys can do what you want, but just don't get in my way. And in fact, you're probably taking up resources that, were, that, were, that could have gone to us. I am happy to report that things have changed greatly since then. The planets really, to, to go from where we were at then to where we're at now, I can say the planets have really aligned. There's a lot of the good things that happened. Given some of the data that I showed you earlier, it's now a class one recommend, exercise training or cardiac rehabilitation is a class one recommendation for all the populations I showed you earlier. We have good performance and practice measures, quality measures that are well, well uh, promulgated advanced by AHA, ACC, in terms of cardiac rehabilitation participation. Those are being revived, re, excuse me, revised literally as I speak and expanded, so that's going to drive things further. I had mentioned now for a certain, patients with a certain type of heart failure, HEF-REF, uh, cardiac rehabilitation is now reimbursed by CMS. Uh, uh, CMS just recently proposed, I don't know if it's going to go through with the current administration, that they incentivize patients to go in cardiac rehabilitation so that if patients go for X number of sessions, we'll pay you X dollars, but if they go for Y number of sessions, we'll pay you more dollars above what you're already paid. Trying to push this idea from CMS's perspective, we know it's valuable, we want to work with you to get more patients in the program, trying to really support that uh, advocacy. Uh, we, we've started a home-based cardiac rehabilitation program in Michigan, work with two of our insurers to get home-based cardiac rehabilitation reimbursed, and just within the past month, NIH put out a, a pre-announcement that they were going to announce uh, award monies or, or funding for cardiac rehabilitation pro, uh, proposals that are focusing on referral in, uh, enrollment and adherence. So really, compared to where we were 35 years ago, the soup is much, much better now than it was uh, before. I would mentioned there's practice guidelines. I just listed seven of them. I think I counted 12 across many of the index events listed in these documents going back, I think the most the earliest is 2011, but even up to more recent, uh, where cardiac rehabilitation or, ex or exercise training is listed as a, as a class 1A recommendation for that patient population. And I, and I also had mentioned that there's performance measures. Right now, the two really uh, most advanced are uh, performance measures are patients should be referred from the inpatient and outpatient settings to cardiac rehabilitation. That's a benchmark that you'll see in many, many different um, register reports or many different, uh, many different uh, quality reports and quality forms using that as a benchmark that patients should be referred. These are being revised and expanded, but uh, clearly they're even in existence today. So, so this is good, much better than where we were before. 
um, it's, it's being advanced by AHA, it's being advanced by ACC, insurance companies are supporting it. Uh, physician support, I will say just, to, just personally, is much better, better than it was 25 years ago, but we still have problems. Despite all of that, one will make the argument that participation in the actual program by patients is only nationally somewhere between 20 to 40 percent. And those that participate, you could take any program, most in the U.S. are probably patients, although most, many might be allowed 36 visits, on average, excuse me, by median, probably 18 to 20, 25 visits of what patients are actually staying. There's, there's more people we need to get in, and we need to get them uh, to, to stay longer. So, so to, to accommodate all of what I would try to advance in terms of getting more people in and keeping them longer, we need more programs, we need bigger programs, and we need more efficiently operated programs. We know that. There's some shortcomings and barriers on our end that we have to work on uh, as well. Uh, this is data from... Uh, this is data from the Action Registry, um, AHA, ACC, AHA Action Registry database, 2016. And you've got uh, over 700, right, over 700 uh, the sites participating in this database. And this is just a frequency distribution. And out of this 700 hospital database, and these are, this is post-MI referral to cardiac rehabilitation, how are these seven sites complying, what percentage of, their, of, their, of the institutions are meeting that, are meeting that threshold of at least 85% adherence to getting their patients referred to cardiac rehabilitation. You can see we've got about 200 of those sites that are close to almost 100% compliance, and then it drops off quite rapidly that there's still another 500 sites that, are, that are, 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 are not meeting the compliance. On average right now, right, on average right now, the overall re mean referral out of this database is about a 74% referral rate, which is not bad, much better than referral. This isn't participation rate, this is referral rate. Uh, not bad, but uh, probably a little bit more, maybe a little bit more room for, uh, room for uh, improvement. Um, here's referral on this side, enrollments on that side. Again, you can see that 74% number is following close to other databases that are reporting out in terms of what's the number of patients being referred. But that's not necessary. It's important. But look at how many patients are actually getting in the program. And now you see the numbers 14%, 40%, 30% of eligible, eligible patients are actually getting in cardiac rehabilitation. This is unpublished data. Somebody was gracious enough to get it to me from CMS from 2000, their most recent run from 2013. Whereas that top number there of 14% was a paper by Swaya from probably published in 2007, but it was probably data that was five, six years preceding that, 260,000 patients, uh, only 14% had at least one, one charge in the Medicare database in 2013, which is probably, again, you know, 10, might have been 10 years later, it could have been as much as 10 years later, the participation rate has gone up to 21%, still not nearly where we want it to be, 50%, 60%, or 70% participation rate. Improved over 14%, but still, but still quite, uh, quite low. I just throw these next two slides up, the Healthy People 2000s, a governmental initiative to set targets for
participation rate. So er, get them as, started as quick as you can. Uh, what's optimal? What do we, I mean, maybe we push the horse pretty heavy. What would be optimal? What would we be shoot for? There's been one paper that said maybe around 17 days is a good balance between safety and, and safety and quickness, so to speak. So it wasn't far off from where we were shooting for. We shoot for about 18 days right now. If you look at some other things that you would just talk about, what would others talk about in other programs in the U.S., for sure we should be getting patients within four weeks. If they have heart failure, try and get them in within seven or eight weeks. What are we seeing as best practice? What are our high performers? Maybe 21 days. Maybe we can get down to this 17-day window to get these patients started quickly. Our heart failure patients get down to as, as, as soon as four weeks. So there's some room we can make. These are operational barriers we can take care of on our end, but strategies can be put into place, get the pro processes in place to make this work. I was going to skip this slide. So, so recently I mentioned, I'll just share this with everybody, recently I mentioned um, that NIH put out an announcement to say we want to look at strategies, we want, to, we want to fund a couple trials that will get patients into cardiac rehabilitation. We want to maybe use technologies, patient behavior changes to really get patients in. Well, here's a lot of the barriers that I think we would say are typical for what you do and typical for what we do for cardiac rehabilitation. Transportation's an issue. I don't have the money to get in. I've got to return to work. It doesn't work out with family timing. Um, they're just not motivated. That's a category that gets filled. Um, I have dependent care, older person, younger care. I have medical issues. And, I don't, and then there's a person is I don't need cardiac rehabilitation. I can do this on my own. So these would be the typical, we did a survey what were pa for patients, why aren't you starting? And these were the top six or seven that we got. And we thought is, what if we came up with a strategy on all of them? And we said, we'll take away all your barriers. If you don't have transportation, we'll work with, we'll work with either home-based rehab or use Uber and Lyft. Don't use a cab company, I promise you. Uh, if, you, if, you if financial's an issue, we'll look at subsidies and incentives. And if, if, if uh, logistics are a problem, maybe home-based or, or we'll have different hours of operation. If they're not motivated, go to incentives. And you can kind of see where we're headed with there. So if you remove all the barriers, how high is high? How high can we get participation in cardiac rehabilitation? Curious about that. Maybe it's 50%, maybe it's 80%. But for everybody, they're gonna have one, two, or three of these barriers. What happens if we remove them? And have strategies in place to try and remove all of those. That's where I think we're gonna to start to head. Uh, one thing we do, I don't know if you guys do this here, but we do a group orientation. So instead of having patients come in one-to-one, -one, we might orientate 10 people, maybe not that many, nine, eight people in our first class, so to speak. And it's free, there's no charge for this, so it doesn't go off to CMS, but it's much more efficient to have one or two people clear six or seven people than to have one person clear one, one person clear one, one person clear one. We now freed up a lot of staff time by clearing these people through in, in, in groups. And we really try to make our, our orientation grab them personally. This is our first contact with them behaviorally. Instead of just talking about this is where you come, this is the equipment, this is the days of operation, we're literally going early on of setting up behaviorally where we want to go. Looking at self-efficacy, looking at their success stories, talking about pessimism, um, a, lot, a lot of cases helping them start to think about what are their, you know, you're 58 years old, what's your, what's your you always talk about your children, what's your five-year plan? Well, what's your five-year plan? What's your 20-year plan? Where are your priorities? And we have some activities built around these, some workbook activities built around these. Look at barrier identification. We have a force field analysis where we look at barrier, barrier identification and management. So first visit, you know, we spend some time on logistics, but we really get them talking in the group setting. That helps as well. So this 60-minute, 70-minute visit, and yes, we show them the equipment, and yes, we show them where you come. But we really try to change the message, so to speak, that it starts to engage them. So they want to come back to that second visit and start to get part two, of the, part two and part three of the story. I just want to finish up on what we think is a, is a unique strategy for us. This is not going to move. At Henry Ford Hospital, we're probably around 40 or 43 percent participation rate. We're not 70 percent. We've got much room to grow. Surgical, no. surgical patients much better. Um, um, heart failure patients much worse, but there's room for us to grow in, in many of our patient populations. One way that we decided to go do that was to try and start a home-based cardiac rehabilitation program. Independent of it being covered insurance, this would just be a good thing to do. We tell all of our patients now to go home and exercise, but let's put some shape around this. How would it look? 
So, so the, the, from, a, from, a particip, from a health system point of view, if we could put this on a telemedicine rail, if we could telemedicine this home-based cardiac rehabilitation, health systems are excited because they view the history, a part of their future in healthcare as being on a telemedicine. Henry Ford has said about 10% of its appointments, so to speak, over I forget what period of time, they want to have done by telemedicine. So they're putting resources, IT, EMR, um, uh, operational services, into setting up these telemedicine. So we got on their rails of telemedicine. We wanted to see where it would go. And again, it's not different than we're telling our patients now, go home and exercise. But we wanted to structure that. Are they doing it? Are they getting educated? What's it look like? So just three terms, or excuse me, four terms that I want to talk about. The facility-based cardiac rehabilitation is what we have here and what we have at our site. It's brick and mortar, patients come someplace. Home-based cardiac rehabilitation is really two type. Uh, one is standalone, and, and by that I mean they never came to any facility at all, and one might be hybrid. It might be they came for one, two, or three sessions of cardiac rehabilitation, or they still come back once a week or once a month to standard facility-based, and the rest is on their own, and it's done in a synchronized manner when they're at home. Um, synchronized, I guess I'll define that first. That's when they're exercising, and we're actually talking to them or seeing them exercising through telemedicine while they're exercising in their gym, at home, at work, on the road. We would be in direct, synchronized, real-time contact with them versus asynchronous, which would be persons on their own at home. We call them later in the week. How have you done with exercise this week? Can you send us our diaries? Let's talk about how your home exercise has gone. This is disjointed between the actual time that they're exercising. This is actually when they're exercising. So, so uh, who did we want to start with? We start, we start with our lower moderate risk per people, these people that have pretty decent functional capacities, three and a half, four metabolic equivalents. They're, you know, generally by exercise test um, um, or history, they've got stable rhythms. Uh, other considerations, if they're on dialysis, probably wouldn't start them in this model here. They probably need more of a supervised session if possible. We try to, as I mentioned, get at least three visits in our facility-based program before we move them to home because we want to look at heart rhythm and look at blood pressures and glucose levels. If, if at all, if, if feasible, we'd like to do that. And we try to do an exercise test before they actually start home-based rehab, kind of as a final screening before they go on their own at home. The exercise prescription is pretty much the same, one to three times per week with us by, by synchronized method, the rest on their own uh, you know, at other times during, during the day. Um, so. So it, we might decrease our synchronized visits to once every other week eventually, but start out heavy and then spread it out. Uh, duration is uh, 30 minutes that we want to exercise with them. During the telemedicine visit, they might only be in contact with us for 15 or 20 minutes or so, and we exercise them at the typical levels we would do in cardiac rehabilitation, 60 to 70 percent of heart rate reserve, or if we're guiding by perceived exertion by about 11 to 14 on a 20-point scale. So similar to what we would do in standard cardiac rehabilitation, we're trying to mimic at home. So, so I put down here a uh, warning. This will likely involve your IT department, your EMR, and virtual care departments. If you guys have worked with them, oh my gosh, I'm sure people have lost their lives trying to work with EMR, or EMR and IT before. I understand that. Uh, but we caught them at a time, at least in our institution, that was really early on in their curve of firing up virtual care, and, and they were able to put some resources uh, uh, onto us. We literally route our, our one-to-way contact with them. They've got their cell phone on one end, their smartphone. We've got our desktop on the other end with a camera, but we route it through our EMR. There's a portal that's, that's a virtually secure network. Uh, um, and, and we route it right through that. It's not FaceTime, it's not Skype, but it's kind of an equivalent of a business Skype, but it's, it's HIPAA compliant and we can route it right through them. Then the patients will get pop-ups on their cell phone just if they were to have an appointment in, in a brick and mortar, they might have an appointment that they've got to schedule upcoming, uh, you know, vid uh, upcoming video visit uh, as well. So they get their reminders so just as a normal brick and mortar appointment, they get their reminders for a, a virtual care visit as well. And we have this conductivity, this synchronized conductivity just use the existing EPIC uh, portal for us to talk with them, uh, talk with them at home. Uh, right, we have to have documentation for these visits if we want to go ahead and, and, get, and enter this into the medical record. So this literally is a template that we have built out in our EMR. A lot of this yellow stuff is stuff that the person is typing as he's talking to the person while they're exercising. So he's got one screen where he sees them, 
one screen where the EMR is open, and while the person's exercising, he's filling in a lot of these blanks in terms of how you're tolerating this. Could be patient education, could be resting values that we took before we start. Uh, we give them a polar monitor uh, to go ahead and be in the home-based program, heart rate monitor to be in the home-based program. So we want to do the documentation just the same as we would do in a facility-based program, collect the same information, and we want to measure the same outcomes. Are there functional outcomes? Are there, are there met levels improving? Nutrition habits improving? Uh, is there, are there mood, are there, are we, you know, are there mood uh, score, scores uh, changing? And, and we do a health-related quality of life before and after. And we can route this through the, we can route this, um, they can open up these, these uh, PDFs through the portal, complete them, and send them back to us. So it doesn't have to go through U.S. mail. It can be, literally be done through the portal that they complete these, and then we don't have to send it to them or send it back. And it can be completed. So it's really pretty slick this way. We, 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 we put a fair amount of time against this. Patient education, so a big part, I said seven lectures, right? On one of my first slides, seven lectures every patient gets as they, as, they come into, as they come into cardiac rehabilitation, seven hours of lecture. Well, how are we going to get those to the patient? Do we print off 130 slides and give them to them? Or what we did is we took those seven lectures and we broke them down into 28 audio PDFs, work with our media department, so the person giving that lecture might take a 15-slide 15, 15 segment out of that talk, and talk just like she, he or she would, giving the lecture, and the person can bring it up on YouTube, and they can just go ahead and play it. I've even given the website down here. If you guys need it, email me. Your patients are welcome to use this. But you know, four, the four nutrition topics might be broken down into 15 you know, vi uh, vignettes, and the couple nutrition lectures, and the risk factor lectures, and the behavioral lectures, those are all been bro been broken down. And then we individualize it to the patient. If we've got a heart failure patient or a, or, or a heart surgery patient, we can pick out of those different files to say these are the ones we want you to view before the next time we see you. Been well tolerated, well enjoyed by the patients, much easier on the staff than trying to keep track about what did we send out. We can just tell them uh, what, what we can just tell the patient which ones we want them to look at. But this made it much slicker and much easier to consume. So one of the challenges that we've heard in the U.S. was well, we're not going to do home-based cardiac rehabilitation because it's not insurance reimbursed. Why are we going to do such a, let's just tell the patients what to do, hope that they do it, and, and don't have to measure all the outcomes and documentation and be so formal and just trust that maybe, maybe by verbalization or the next time they come in for rehab, we'll ask, how have you been doing at home? But it, that is a loose process where there's really no guarantees that the patients were doing it at home. So every state has a telemedicine law, and there'll be one for Vermont. This is Michigan's telemedicine law, and it literally says to, to bill for, the, for a telemedicine visit, you have to have real-time contact by audio, could be just phone, or video. We've gone to the video step so that we're actually using, a, using their smartphone to go ahead and bill for this. I approached uh, Blue Cross Blue Shield in Michigan. I approached Health Alliance Plan in Michigan. They both said they would cover it. So right now we're getting coverage for home-based cardiac rehabilitation. Very, very pleased with this, but it really helped. This isn't going to move us from 40% participation to 70. This is going to move us from 40 to 40 plus a little bit. It's helping us move in the right direction to get a little bit more of those patients that otherwise are saying no to coming to cardiac rehabilitation for some of those barriers that might be linked to that. And, and again, if the blue collar, blue, collar, blue collar state, right, uh, automotive, a lot of, lot of Blue Cross Blue Shield uh, covered lives in, in Michigan, about 4.3 million members for Blue Cross Blue Shield. About 80% of them are in their preferred provider, which, which is the one that they said they would cover, uh, put cardiac rehabilitation coverage in. So from our perspective, between HAP and Blue Cross combined, I would guess that's probably 60% of our patients that we would see. Any of those that say, no, I can't come to cardiac rehabilitation, we're trying to push in this direction if it's a barrier that we can overcome. So we've done about 200 plus uh, home-based CR visits so far through April 30th. We've had no safety issues. It's been well tolerated. Attendance at scheduled sessions is about the same as attendance at brick and mortar. About 80% of the population shows up. We schedule two weeks out, um, so we don't just do it the next day. We will schedule out two weeks we're, so that we get this on their book, get it in the system so they get their reminders. And all claims we've submitted so far have been paid by the payers. And again, this isn't the driving force but we were, overcome, we were trying to overcome the, the barrier that a lot of programs were saying, well, we can't do this because it's not covered. At least in the state of Michigan, we've been able to get, overcome that barrier. All the usual culprits that you have for adherence that I showed earlier still apply here. 
patients with timing, child care issues, return to work issues, but this, we're trying to get through most of those. Professionally, this is probably one of the most gratifying things I've been involved with because we've really tried to impact a small segment of the population that wasn't coming. Our administrators love it. The payers are pleased to be involved in, in, in um, virtual care kind of um, um, uh, policy, so to speak. Our phys I'm getting emails from physicians, then they're really pleased that we've got this option for the patients, and the patients actually like it as well. Um, they're very pleased, high, uh, high satisfaction scores um, as, as a result of making the offer. Um, what have we learned? We've cut down our, our home-based cardiac rehab visits from about 30 minutes. We've got it down to about 20 minutes now. It took us about nine minutes, excuse me, nine months to start up from thought to, to implementation. My guess is this year we're going to be somewhere around 35 or 40 patients. Large opportunity for re research expectations in terms of exercise intensity at home, adherence at home, demographic take up. Um, there's, there's some good, we're keeping data on all this, so there's some good options here uh, to pursue in terms of research findings to, to move things forward. So in, in, in summary, cardiac rehabilitation is effective. We're pleased with that. The data is really strong, uh, but it's underutilized. We're probably around 30 to 40, and we want to get to about a 70% participation rate. And, and the, 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 the demographics of non-participation and the barriers to participation can vary by, vary by demographics, can vary by location, um, vary by, by at the system level, at the patient level, at the policy level. They're, they're, all of these things really come into play that we, there's a lot of overcoming that we have to do. But, but I think systematically we should be able to match a fix to many of these, and that's what we want to try and do over the next five years for those patients with ma major policy, or excuse me, major barriers that we want to improve, that we want to improve uh, participation in. So I'm gonna leave it there, I'm gonna take uh, two questions, but I did want to show you the, the Phil Lady's home-based cardiac rehabilitation model. Some of you may have seen this, uh, seen this before, so. Ended on a down note there. Sorry. Yeah. We have to leave the room maybe in two minutes, so we have time for a question or two. Uh, I'll ask a very quick question. I like that you have a default on the referral that everyone on your inpatient service gets referred, but a lot of people on the inpatient service don't have covered diagnoses. So are you wasting a lot of time on people with atrial fibrillation and all these other things? So it, it, it could be. Or do you match to diagnosis? Uh, so we clearly can match to diagnosis. And so when, so when that pops up, when that pops up, um, the patient's discharged from the hospital, and that pops up in the work queue for the outpatient people, they'll see everybody that was discharged today. And they'll see all of their diagnoses that were discharged today. So the MIs and the, and the cabbages or whatever, those are the yeah. ones they can go after but first. But at the medical record level, could the default to check the box be has, has not been screened by through. diagnosis? Yeah, has not been screened we'll through. You, we, you could okay. set a filter. Good point. You Maybe. could set a filter at that at that level. We I will also say that we go through once a week and and search all patients discharged from Henry Ford Hospital by diagnosis yeah. and then do filter okay. those patients that are not. Okay. Yeah. Great to see some cardiology fellows here, David.
after her first 36 digits were at So it is. Slugging it out is can be made to the other side. I apologize that we have to leave the room, but I just want to mention there is a lunch at the Ghost Green Unit, UHC room 4325 in Portland. He will be there. You're all invited to connect.